ladies, gentlemen, and disappointments. We are coming to you live from the Woman Caves in New York and Connecticut. My name is Leslie. And my name is Melissa. And we are Verbally Disaster. This podcast is copyrighted through the U.S. Copyright Office as well as the Writers Guild of America. Hello everyone, this is your host, Leslie M. Jasper of the Verbally Disastrous Podcast that can be found on over 20 podcast platforms and YouTube. For this episode, I decided to talk to you about my time when I worked between ditches, bucket trucks, and railroad work. So, between working with the tools and working within a management capacity. The majority of my experience is probably between railroad work and subway work. Over the course of my now over 27 year career, including my time in the U.S. Navy Seabees when I became a construction woman electrician, then I got into Local 3 IBEW out of New York City, right out of the military. So with this said, most of my experience has been on various railroad projects. This experience has been within both a worker and a manager capacity. My most favorite task to work on with the tools is bucket truck work. I'll probably say that a couple times during this podcast. So bear with me. I don't care. (laughs) I enjoy the work tremendously and no matter the climate. I've spent quite a few hours on a piece of plywood on my back with my chain wrench installing rigid conduit under various railroad platforms. My railroad experience with the tools was even encountered while I was pregnant. (laughs) That is another podcast episode and a short story with my Kindavella series, so go check that out. My Kindavella library is entitled construction tales told by a woman. I know I was initially working with the low voltage community doing punch downs when I first got into the business. Many people would tell me that I should have stayed within that easier realm of work since it felt like I was being groomed to become a specialist aka a data fairy as an apprentice. However, I'm a glutton for punishment. As a woman in construction since the 1990s, I've always believed that I needed to be even more valuable than my peers. My goal was to not be a person on the first round of layoffs, since that would suck and not in a good way, when a project was winding down its workforce. I know that this even meant being prepared to work in the harshest conditions possible as an electrician. I feared getting comfortable and staying as a data fairy throughout my apprenticeship only to be put on a conduit job as a journeywoman and being absolutely clueless on the work. I knew that in order to accomplish this, I needed to leave the warmth and ease of the low voltage world and tread towards those harsh waters. (laughs) As an apprentice electrician, I was studying for both my Connecticut E2 electrical license and the final New York exam that's required in order to earn my journeywoman status. For the record, despite the fact that I don't work with the tools anymore, I still hold my Connecticut E2 license and I refuse to give it up. It it took a tremendous amount of studying and work and it was a labor of love to go (laughs) all the way up to Hartford, Connecticut I think it was West Hartford, Connecticut, to stay the night before and then sit in a three-hour exam. Now you can do it on the computer and you don't have to physically be in Connecticut, but that was during a different time frame. The pay increase was tremendous for the Connecticut E2 license, and it would change my personal life as a widow dramatically. That was a heavy goal that weighed over my head And I felt like it would change my life dramatically. Like once I passed that test, because it had meant everything to me, I will still keep it. 
I probably will keep it until I retire because you never know these licenses you go to certain states maybe you have to have it depending on what capacity there's reciprocal licenses for different states depending on the state maybe I'll want to go for an e1 electrical license and hold it at least one of my sons are in the business so maybe I'll want to hold it for my eldest you must always leave the doors open just in case while I was taking that test I have never been so nervous about an exam in my entire life I was shaking the first couple of minutes when I got into the classroom once I told my classmates that I was gonna stay up at the hotel the night before just in case it snowed they joined me in the same hotel they were having a great old time some of them were hitting every strip club along I-95 on the way up in the morning they were doing mimosas and my crazy ass was all nervous and didn't want to do it which I probably should have because it would have calmed my nerves so I probably spent the first 20 minutes in the testing area unable to focus because I was so nervous about this test everything was riding on passing all those exams and getting out of poverty because <laughs> that's basically what it was it was more than merely passing an exam it was a major life transition for my son and I the pressure was quite intense as an apprentice I was battling the nerves as the only woman on the job and sheer exhaustion I was working up the three jobs <laughs> at the time you would never catch me doing that today I would I would rather go work or go live somewhere in a box <laughs> in South Carolina than work the amount of hours that I did back when I was an apprentice. I was working up the three jobs, finishing my associate degree in business, chasing after a toddler, and maintaining my home as an apprentice. I worked seven days a week <laughs> and averaged 120 hours per week for a few years of my apprenticeship. Yep, I would not be willing to do that again. I was running on three to four hours of sleep per night. As an older woman, I do not have the energy to accomplish that same schedule today. I don't have it in me. With all of what was going on, I didn't feel like I was able to focus to a degree that I desired. I would pull up at a stoplight and literally would get honked at when the light turned green because I decided to take a cat nap at the light. I was super determined to not only get through this apprenticeship but become the most knowledgeable journey woman that I could become. I still report to this day that it is still a work in progress. I don't think I'm the dumbest person on the job but I don't think I'm the smartest so I'm usually pretty hard on myself but I like to learn and be knowledgeable about everything so I'll go study something on my own time. At the time I believed that I needed that new work experience in order to become a well-rounded electrician. Who knows if I would have still been a highly sought after low voltage data fairy today if I would have stayed the course. I have no idea if that would have panned out for me or not. At the time I didn't have the faith that I would have been blessed with only that type of work for my entire career. I did the unthinkable by expressing to my apprentice director at the time that I wanted to leave the shop that I was in and learn another form of electrical work. Prior to reaching out, I did express that to the shop managers that I wanted to be placed in different job experiences. It appeared <laughs> that that all fell on deaf ears. At the time, I was being sent to projects as a solo act to work on data and I was knocking it out. If I was management, I would have tried to keep me on the path as our data person as well. It made sense to bill out as a journeyman while sending a second year apprentice to complete the work. I do not regret my decision to leave the safety net of the data world and veer towards unforgiving deck jobs. <laughs> These new commercial projects had slowly prepared me for the realm of railroad work. It took me about eight years into my career before I was able to land on my first railroad project. 
In the same shop, I also got to perform my favorite bucket truck work. The good news about landing in this shop is that I get to work again with my close pal, Donnie. Donnie is a high voltage splicer who is now enjoying about 10 years worth of retirement. And I'm very happy for him. I'm going to meet up with him real soon this week to go to a charity event that I'm looking forward to going to. So he's always fun to hang out with and we break each other's chops. We worked together in a small circle of fellow electricians. Our fearless leader drove the shop van and came around periodically to see what we needed. I appreciated that we were not micromanaged by our general foreman, who was rather charming, witty, and sarcastic. (laughs) It didn't take long to figure out that this shop was all outside work. While it was great experience, it was very taxing on the body. In my electrical career, I learned that bucket truck work is my absolute favorite type of work. Did I mention that before? Probably not. (laughs) I first cut my teeth on bucket truck work when I worked on the military base as a U.S. Navy CB while stationed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I remember changing a fuse cutout on a telephone pole in a rainstorm while on the base. Not just a rainstorm, a thunder and lightning storm. I was told to punch the fuse cut out hard and very fast with the long extendo stick. I learned really quick as to why I was firmly instructed to do this correctly. I was only 18 years old when I was doing this work for my very first time. Despite going fast, I saw the blue arc from the line side of the pole reach out towards the extendo stick and the fuse cut out of course. Despite the apparent danger, I felt like it was super exciting and serious work that fascinated me highly. Years later as a civilian worker while working in a union shop, we set quite a few lighting poles and many different parking lots. These tasks were performed no matter the weather. I remember trying to focus while setting poles in an absolute downpour. Perhaps the only time we would pause would be during nearby thunder and lightning. So it makes sense to do a little pause pause. I hated wearing rain jackets when it was humid outside since I would get hot and sweaty. I felt like I was going to get wet anyway so I might as well get wet with the rain. Therefore I was sometimes working in the rain in a t-shirt. And I wasn't the only one in my crew working in the t-shirt, so that was good. I wasn't the only lunatic. One of the many experiences I had in this shop was working on modifying live switchgear. I got to team up on this task with a guy that I will say his name is Harry, who I didn't feel at first was going to get along with me. I prematurely assumed that he would treat me like shit due to my gender. Luckily, I was wrong with this assumption on my part. As with anyone I worked with during my career, I rolled up my sleeves and watched my partner's moves, and then I moved accordingly. I always worked on a task that he hadn't tackled yet while setting up. He recognized my hard work and even gave me some compliments, which was cool. In hindsight, he was rather fair with how he treated me. His fairness with me helped to ease my nerves and it honestly aided in how well we worked together. On the job, our co-workers used to playfully call him the raging midget. However, when we worked together, there was no shouting unless he was pissed at other people. Then again, I have a low-key temperament and do not try to piss off the guy that I have to spend many hours at work with. That would be foolish, right? Despite his nickname, He was a strong man who was witty and loaded with energy. I remember watching him climb a tree like it was nothing. When we were working on existing parking lot lights and needed some elevation and lacked a suitable ladder, he improvised and climbed the nearby tree. (laughs) I was impressed with how spry he was and that was in the back of the mental Rolodex. It didn't take long to realize that Harry was rather fearless and a huge risk taker. Despite being both cautious and surprised with his actions, I knew that I needed to be as supportive yet careful 
as possible on my end. Admittedly, some of the risks I have taken in the early part of my career is stuff that I would not do today. This has a lot to do with the fact that as of the recording of this podcast episode, I am now a New York City site safety manager, so I can't take those kinds of risks or I would lose my license that I worked for the past two years on to achieve. I have stepped into that role of a safety manager, so of course I can't take those risky actions. We had to cut windows into some live switch gear to add brand new switch gear. In case you do not know, switch gear is a very large commercial power supply. A simple residential house panel would not be sufficient to handle the amount of power that is required for the commercial space. Switch gear sections are joined together in an effort to isolate the high voltage that it contains just to keep the people on the outside of the distribution gear from getting killed. In the event of a problem with the high voltage, workers could experience an arc blast that would explode and cause molten copper to blast outwards with an extreme swift and high force. Anyone within the path of an arc blast would most definitely receive severe injuries. This risk was something that I was aware of, yet didn't think I would be in danger. Hence, the bad side of being a young person in your 20s because you think you're invincible. This is the bad part of being comfortable and fearless in your job that I do not recommend at all. The older I am, the less that I want to take risks. The window that we had to cut was awfully close to some live feeder wires that came in from the manholes in the street. My job was to watch Harry's grinder blade while he penetrated the side of the existing switchgear. In the beginning of the task, I did tell Harry that this was a very dangerous task. (laughs) Very obvious to both of us. It was dangerous for him because he was touching the switchgear with his grinder and could very well make contact with at least 5,000 volts. On my end, I would get caught up with an arc blast from the equipment. Harry very simply replied, Oh, I know. That's why you will pay attention. (laughs) I gave a nervous laugh and walked up to the front of the switchgear being penetrated. Of course, I screamed loud each and every time to stop when he was near the live feeder conduits. We got through that hairy task with no issues. Thank God. Another dumb thing on my part was that I was not wearing flame retardant clothing, much less the required flash suit. The flash suit has a protective helmet that fully covers your face. It's either a jumpsuit or jacket and pants and rubber glove. The average flash suit must be a minimum arc rating of 25 cal. We worked with a 50 cal flash suit and I have seen suits as high as 100 cal. You must f- inspect for damage each and every time you put it on and put it away. Foolishly, I opted to not put it on or ask for it from our general foreman. Technically, an electrician should wear a flash suit when they energize a circuit breaker for the very first time. We cannot always assume that the circuit breaker has been made with zero defects from the manufacturer. This wraps up part A, episode 41, working on the railroad with the tools as a chick. To check out part B and the last half of the discussion, head into the podcast platform of your choice and look for part B to finish the discussion. I thank you for taking the time to listen to this part, and I wish you a great day. Peace out, Cub Scout. This wraps up another episode on the Verbally Disastrous podcast that can be found on over 20 podcast platforms, including Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Pandora Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information, head over to our website at www.constructiontales.com. I thank you for listening and have a great day. 
This podcast is protected through the U.S. Copyright Office as well as the Writers Guild of America.